These are all negatives in here. Photography is history. There are certain moments which we don't see unless we photograph them. If you photograph a face, a person, a personality, you want to get the soul of that person. You don't want to get the color of the person. I was born in Berlin. I somehow grew up during the Nazi period. I didn't get too involved with the Hitler youth. I lived most of the time with my mother. I remember when I was about 10 or 11 years old, I asked her, who is this crazy man who's all, all the time shouting. And he, he sounds terribly angry to me on the radio. And she says, Psh, quiet, you mustn't talk about it, otherwise we get into trouble. When the air raid started, we went to air raid shelter and I took my first photograph. There's a friend who was a professional photographer since the schools, they were all burned down and there was nothing for me to do. He took me on as a photographer. And this is how I began doing photography and I haven't stopped doing it ever since. I left Berlin when the blockade started and I went to Hamburg where I joined the German press agency as a volunteer. In 1950, when I was 19 years old, I then went to South Africa. Europe wasn't very interested in African situations. Most of the newspapers didn't really report about the events, so I didn't really know anything. I got onto a train from Cape Town to Johannesburg. I spoke still very little English. In the same compartment, I found there was an elderly man who had white hair and looked very distinguished and spoke fluent German. To my horror, I discovered that he was an extreme Nazi. I just left the end of fascism and I arrived at a place at the beginning because that man was involved in the apartheid government. And this man, in a few words, explained to me the, their plans and what they were going to do, how much he admired Hitler, what they're going to do to the black people, how they're going to keep them away and separate them. I was so shocked and horrified, I sort of go from the frying pan into the fire. And I didn't know then where to go next. <laughs> what am I do now? <laughs> When I went to look for a job in the white paper, there were no documentary magazines. Somebody told me that there was a new magazine called Drum, but they said, oh, I wouldn't go there, it's only for blacks, and I wouldn't work with them, it's not worth it, and they have no money, and so on. I thought, well, that's it, I must go there. I got £40 a month <laughs> for being the picture editor, the, the designer, um, the, the art director, and the production manager, and one time I did circulation as well. At the time, there were no black photographers in South Africa. They never had the opportunities to study photography or uh, to earn cameras. I had to then help teaching or mentoring young black people to study and work as photojournalists in the magazine, which became very successful. There were a few newspapers, 
but they were run by whites. They didn't cover black events at all. And what drum did, I think it gave the black population an identity. There was no identification for sports affairs, for cultural affairs, for social affairs. So this is what's drum's biggest effort. Of course, occasionally when we managed to get away with it, we did the odd story exposing the injustice of apartheid. the apartheid system became more and more aggressive and more and more people were arrested and locked up for long periods of time. Papers were closed down for political reasons. There was a tremendous restriction for black people. Dolly Rateba was the first black film star we decided to do a cover story on her. And we thought, well, we must have her in a bathing costume or a bikini on the beach. So we couldn't go to the sea, but around Johannesburg, you have there these huge heap of sand near a white suburb. So we both went there and we climbed up to the top. We're laughing and joking. She had a bag with her clothes and I had a bag with my camera. There was a man he must have seen there's a black woman and a young white man climbing up to the mine down with bags. So he fought the cops. And we were just finished taking pictures. The cops arrived. And I saw them coming from all sides. <laughs> and they were very excited. They pushed us around. They thought we had committed the Immorality Act, which is sex across the color bar lines, which means you get nine months prison. First of all, we both started laughing at the bloody idiots, what they want. But they behaved just like the, the Gestapo, like the SS. And I said, you bloody Gestapo, are you? <laughs> so, so they started to push me around and they started pushing her. And then they took us to the police station and uh, I, I told them, I said, I was a journalist and we were doing a story and she was a film star. And then I got a long lecture from the officer saying that, you, you Germans, you come here and uh, you think you can do what you like and so on, and uh, uh, you must understand we don't mix with these people, they're separate. So you were constantly confronted with this stupidity, you see. Sophia Town was a suburb close to the center of the city. There was something special about it. Kids were playing in the street and there was somebody playing music. And then there was a band marching through town for a wedding ceremony, a brass band, like you had in New Orleans. It was packed with a lot of political people and artists. And it was full of fun. The problem for the government was that this was what they call the black spot. They'd bulldozed the whole town. They rebuilt a white suburb and they called it Triumph. They moved all the black people to a place called Meadowlands. They came with military trucks and picked them up. They didn't want black people to live too close to white suburbs. They wanted to be totally socially, economically, politically separated. The first time I photographed Dos Madera was in December 1951. There was the annual ANC conference and he had just been appointed the youth leader of the ANC. All the politicians were terribly nervous and uptight, and Mandela was totally relaxed. <laughs> I was very impressed by him. For a small country like this to have produce a person that has done so much for his country and is so much appreciated worldwide is so important. 
I hope and I think he will have that effect for many generations to come. And in more recent years, he used to see me and he says, hello, why haven't you retired yet? I said, what are you talking about? Why haven't you retired? There's only one secret. You have to be at the right time, at the right place, and you have to be the first. That's pure luck. Look at anybody who took some great picture who has become well known. Usually it was because he was there first. <laughs> and I happened to be the first there. I started getting worried. One uh, special branch that put a f once a nine millimeter revolver on my head and said, I'm going to kill you, don't worry, I'm going to get you. So you were constantly confronted with this, this evil. I thought that they would confiscate my negatives or would deport me. I couldn't take it anymore. I wanted to get to Europe and have some fresh air. <laughs> The Sunday Times commissioned me to do a story on people living in deep poverty in London. And I came back with my pictures and they looked at it and they said, Mr. Schaderberg, we are, we are a, a, a reputable paper. We are not the, the Guardian. I said, well, what's that got to do with it? Yeah, well, we want pictures of social workers working and being frustrated and these people don't want to work and so on and so forth. So uh, I said, well, I'm sorry, you can't do it. I sent them a bill and they paid the bill, but they never published the pictures. All the magazines were closing down. So then, of course, we got into books instead. And we did a lot of books. We did about 30 or more books. I didn't even count them anymore. I get very involved, I get very emotional. I photographed, especially in Africa, I photographed the political scene when, when the African started singing uh, Sikile in Africa. I st started photographing, I tear some eyes, you see. I suddenly feel it. It's an emotion, it's a very strong emotion. Um, it happens when you, pho when you photograph and you see something and you feel it. You can feel what the people are feeling because you're focusing on that moment. It's their photo album. It's their history. A life of living, of being, of absorbing. Photography is an attempt to tell the true story in making people happy.